topic that is very close to my heart and it's also very close to the hearts of our people here at Harriet Watt University, which is about the, the future of our youth and the dreams that we are having and how education enable uh, these, these dreams. But before I start, I wanted to share something with you. I'm sure you can, you can see the picture of the play that I put on the slides. And you can see these crack lines that are colored with, with a golden color. This is actually gold. What happened in Japan when a pottery piece when a plate or a teapot breaks, not, not everybody throw them away and go to the supermarket to buy a new one. Some people see an opportunity there. So what do they do? They repair the, the, the plate. They put it back, but they use gold. They don't use super glue. They use gold to repair it. And the philosophy is very profound and very simple yet very beautiful they are recognizing that this the experience through which this plate has been being shattered being broken is actually a unique experience that will make this plate very special very unique one of its own kind and that's why they repair it with gold to increase its value put it together and emphasize its uniqueness. I'm very sure that the Japanese artists and craftsmen, they, they could, with a bit of effort, put the plate back uh, into and, and make it almost look like new, or even throw it away and buy a new one, because gold, as we know, is a very expensive thing. But they chose to embrace the, the experience that this plate uh, has been has been through and created an art form of it. This art is called uh, Kintsugi and I encourage you to Google the word Kintsugi to see the many beautiful and unique artifacts that are created with that. So why I'm starting your Saturday morning with this story? Because actually when you reflect on last year, 2020, we can't say, we cannot but say that this was a challenging year. It was also a special year. I think the pandemic was tough for most of us, if not all of us. Schools and universities were closed. And that's why I believe the pandemic was especially difficult for, for young people, particularly those transitioning into university. These people, these young people, our children, they had great dreams. They wanted to do so many things. They dreamt of a very different university experience or even a high school experience. But guess what? Schools were closed. The classes were interrupted. The exams were canceled. Many of their plans were disrupted. And some of their dreams of studying overseas, having very meaningful and life-changing social experiences were simply shattered. So the question that I would like to ask you is if, if, this, if these experiences, the academic and the social experiences are broken like this artifact of us to, to your left, how can we help our youth put it back together? with gold so that they emerge from this stronger, even more resilient, more versatile, and, and more perfect, actually, by embracing who they really are. I really think this is not only a philosophical question, I think this is an essential uh, question that we as educators and we as parents need to answer together. 
I believe that this is a special generation. This generation is the generation and maybe the first generation in quite a number of years who is able to answer the typical interview question, how did you or how can you deal with adversity or do you have examples where you've successfully dealt with challenges in a way that maybe even their parents are unable to 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 answer. And this is actually very, very special. And I think. Our challenge and our opportunity as parents and as educators is to. Be part of that precious metal, part of that gold that's going to help. Our youth make this experience a positive one. I think we first need to start by changing the narrative and not only speak about the 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 pandemic experience in negative terms, but see it as this. Opportunity that actually brought our youth to the level where they are realizing their. True potential through the challenge that they face, they re realizing how strong they are. They are realizing how connected is the world. They are also realizing how important family is. So. We all have a role to play. And policymakers, parents and education, education institutions and educators are to play a key role in this. I encourage you, if you are a young person listening to me, or if you are a parent who is listening here, to really think of this experience in the most positive way that you can. Because the experience has happened. There's no way we could go back and change the situation, but we can change the way we think about it so that we can create that Kintsugi piece or art piece out of uh, this experience. Now, there are certain things that we all need to, to do, and particularly as uh, academic institutions, so that we keep the dreams alive. Dreams are not just the right for the young people. They are actually their duty because without dreams, how are we going to create a better place? You know, people have dreams for themselves, but these collective dreams, they make the world a better place. And it's our role as society, as community, as educators, as policymakers, and as parents to enable these dreams to, to stay alive, keep them keep the flame burning, but also take them to to a new level. So as educators, as a university for us, we are planning to be very. Very flexible, and I think flexibility is a key word here. We understand that many of the students who are coming through our system, they have attainment gaps, they have confidence gap. They were unable to acquire all the uh, knowledge pieces that we we expect them to have so that they do all the challenging courses that we we offer but we we plan to be to work with them we have um, programs to help them fill these attainment gaps the academic attainment gaps and also the confidence uh, gaps now I wanted to say a little bit about the future the future of jobs the role of of us human beings in 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 in, in, in staying relevant uh, through adding value to ourselves and our community. And also, I wanted to talk a little bit about our unique um, approach at Harriet Watt University to enabling these dreams to uh, remain uh, uh, alive. Now, if you think of anything that we do as as humans, whether it's a hobby or a work or, or anything that we come to life with, we bring three types of capabilities. I call them the three labors. We bring our physical labor or our physical capability, which is our muscular capability and our capability to manipulate and move objects aside. We also bring our cognitive labor or cognitive capability, which is our ability to, to think and reason, 
and we bring also our emotional capabilities, which is you know, our capability to be self-aware, empathize with others, uh, build relationships and build trust. We need all these three capabilities to do almost anything, but we need them with, with different proportions. So for example, if you just give me um, a broomstick and ask me to sweep the floor, I still need my you know, mental faculties to control my muscles to do the needful, but most of the work will be purely manual. Now, if you, are, if you are asking me to do a bit more a skilled work, maybe welding or something like that, that requires um, different level of dexterity and also uh, a higher level of cognitive skills and, and also maybe even the emotional capabilities. Now, at the highest level of the physical labor is our, is our capability to do precision work. Maybe precision work if you are um, a heart surgeon changing a heart valve. I think that would require, uh, yes, the cognitive capabilities, the emotional capabilities, but it requires certain level of dexterity at the, at the hands of the, of the surgeon. Our cognitive capability starts at the lowest level with memory, our ability to memorize things moves to analysis, critical thinking, and ultimately creativity. While our emotional labor, as I said, has things of like being aware, being able to act ethically in difficult situations and also build trust with other people. Now, we as human beings have been throughout our history on a journey of trying to replace ourselves by some other form of, of energy or power or using tools because we would like to have uh, a more enjoyable, uh, easier life because that's part of, of progress. So the wheel was invented um, around maybe 5,000 plus years ago. And this was a, a key moment in, in the human history because that enabled so many other tools and, and, um, uh, and, and machines that made life much easier. Now, the shaded area in this graph is the area where we were able to replace ourselves with some other form of energy or form of uh, machine or technology. The situation improved slightly between the 3500 BC until the time of the first industrial revolution where James Watt perfected the steam engine. And that was the time where we had so many more machines that were stronger, faster, and more capable than us in the physical domain. And that was the time where John Henry, who was a very strong man, and he used to be able to dig the mines faster than any mechanical digger died while he was competing against a mechanical digger. And after that, there's no way we can think of a human being who can dig earth faster than a machine. Now, that was also the time where our university started, or around that, in 1821, around 200 years ago. Where, because that was the time where many people lost their jobs. Many people who did manual jobs, they were, they were knitting fabrics, they were doing farming and all sorts of things. And all these things simply over really a very short period of time disappeared because we started using machines who were much cheaper, much faster and better. And that's why uh, universities like Heritwat University started to train these people who wanted to move from the physical domain to the cognitive domain. So we started training scientists, engineers, accountants, and, 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 and managers. But so you see the, the, the gray area where we moved to after the first industrial uh, revolution from the physical labor to the cognitive labor. Now, interestingly, that was also around the time where we started to make some rudimentary machines that were able to do things that were back then assumed to be 
truly human. Things like being able to add two numbers together. So there were some mechanical machines where you could crank the number two, then crank the symbol plus, then crank the number three, and then crack the machine again, and it will give you a five. Now, we would laugh at this. We will say, why do you want to do this? Because you could add two plus three in, in your head, and you will do it almost effortlessly. But these were really the forefathers of the, the computers that we have now. But back then, the thinking was the most important thing that a human being brings to, to their work or to the life is their cognitive capability, is the ability to think and analyze and, and create new, new, new stuff. But guess what? The history repeated itself. And again, slowly but surely, machines became stronger than us when it comes to uh, performing cognitive tasks. And 1997 was another watershed moment when another machine, a computer this time, was able to beat a, a very strong human being at their game. Deep Blue, which was a computer made by IBM, was able to beat Gary Kasparov, who was the world uh, champion in chess, at the game of chess. Now, since then, we call this the digital revolution, but since then, the computers kept on being stronger, faster, cheaper than us, and this trend is expected to continue. As a matter of fact, now we are having what we call the fourth industrial revolution, where computers are performing so many tasks in the background on our behalf. And this is, at a certain level, a good progress. But at the same time, imagine accountants' jobs, imagine uh, so many uh, truck drivers' jobs, imagine so many other jobs just disappearing. For, for those who are parents in the room would remember the time when we, when we uh, wanted to buy um, a, a, a plane ticket. We will go to KL and then we go to, um, uh, there was this building next to the KLCC where it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore, where there were so many travel agents and we go from one place to, to other looking for the best, best deal. Now, you can't think of buying um, um, an air ticket when travel is back, hopefully, from, from a, a travel agent. We just go online and buy it. Now, this is good for us. It's progress. It saves us a lot of time and money. But think of the people who lost their jobs because of that. Now, we are now at this moment where our physical capabilities are mostly done by machines, and they are done better than us, where cognitive capabilities that we bring, the value we create through the, our cognitive labor, cognitive capabilities, is also being challenged by, by, by machines. So what do, we, what do we have left for us? Actually, what is left is what you see to the right of the graph that I have put on the, on the, on the screen. It's, some people will get jobs because they have, they have through their physical capabilities, because they are athletes or, or artists or are able to do high precision work, the cognitive capabilities like creativity and critical thinking will uh, remain in demand. And, and, but mainly, the bit that machines had very little progress at, if at all, is the emotional domain. And this is where our full potential is. This is where the goal is. This is where the goal that we can use to prepare our youth's experience is by building them with empathy, self-awareness, ability to build relationships, ability to have a positive uh, mindset. Now, this is very important because emotional labors and emotional skills are very difficult to teach. They are very difficult to learn. And they are even more difficult to measure. If I'm here to give you a mathematics uh, lecture, and let's say I'm teaching you the multiplication table, and I want you to remember that 5 times 3 is 15, I could teach you that. 
I could give you by the end of the lecture a test and I could certify you as being able to do multiplication. But if this was a lecture about building relationships, it's actually very difficult for me to, at the end of the lecture, certify that you became a master relationship builder. It doesn't work like that. It is very difficult and it is very unique, just like the Kintsugi art. It is very unique for each individual and each individual will be doing it in a, in a very uh, different way. So this is extremely important. But I want you to remember that whatever the dream that you have, if you are a student, and whatever the dream you have for your child, if you are a parent, the future is human. And the future will be for the engineers and the actuarial scientists and the doctors and the accountants and the psychologists and all the professionals out there to, yes, have their academic credentials, but build it on a strong basis of being emotionally intelligent and being truly human. Now, this is this is actually very good news because that emotional labor is is something that machines can't do, at least can do now. But it is also something that we have been struggling with for quite some time. So for example, this research which was done a year plus ago by the uh, Kazana Research Institute, and it's about transitioning our young uh, students from school to work. And they ask employers, what is missing? What, do, what would you like the Malaysian youth to have. And guess what? Nobody said we want more mathematics or more physics or more technical skills because we are doing a great job at inculcating that. But they say we want strong work ethics. We want people who are able to communicate. We want people who are creative. We want people who are able to do analytical thinking. We want people who have positive mindset, positive attitude learn from criticism and work under pressure. So these are the things that are all in the mindset rather than in the skill set. Not because the skill set is not that important, but because we are doing so well at the, at the, at the skill set. Now, this is one of my favorite uh, quotes by Andy Haldane, who's the chief economist of Bank of England. He said that study, students may be better off developing emotional intelligence than cognitive skills, than thinking skills, to prepare for a future of work in which they will be competing against robots. As a matter of fact, we are advocating that if the race is between us and the robots, and if the measures of success is how strong, how precise, how cheap, how big is your memory, how quickly you could process things. I think we have lost the race already. But the future we are advocating is a future in which humans, because of their emotional capabilities, they are able to lead these robots and use these robots to make this world a better place for each and every one of us. This is the dream. This is the dream that we are advocating, and this is the dream that we are part of creating for uh, ourselves and also for, uh, for, our, for our youth. So it's very important that we keep on thinking that a race against the machine we will lose. But a race that is based on what makes us humans, a race based on the things that machines can do, is really the way to bet our futures at. Now, how do we do this? Because you may ask me, Mushtaq, you, you said it's difficult to teach, it's difficult to learn, and it's difficult to measure. So how are we doing it? So let me tell you, how we do it at Harriet Watt University. We call it positive education. And positive education, as you could see in the 
middle circle that I have here has three components. The first component is academic excellence. So we start by, if you are doing engineering or accountancy or, or any of the or management or psychology or building studies or actuarial science, all these are highly regulated professional courses. So academically, you will be fully aware of its academic underpinning. You'll be fully aware and you need to be fully aware of the professional codes and the legal codes that that governs that. So we take this for granted. We work on it very hard and we achieve academic excellence. But there are other two components or the jigsaw pieces. One is the character and the values and the soft skills. How do we build that? And this, uh, this is a very important part of positive education. The other part is well-being. How do we ensure that our youth, our students are uh, operating in, in, in a place where um, uh, they, their well-being is very well uh, taken care of? So these are the three, three pieces and there are programs to build uh, the well-being and the characters and values and I'll speak very very briefly about them. Now, the other thing that makes positive education and sets it apart is that bit in the center, purpose. Every one of our students in their first year of study develops what we call an impact statement. We want them to be crystal clear of why they are born in this world. What is that calling? What is that thing that brings the deepest motivations to, to their lives? And our dream is, if you go to our, any of our campuses and ask a student, why are you doing here? Instead of him telling you, him or her telling you, I'm doing chemical engineering or I'm doing psychology, we would like them to look you in the eyes and say, before I graduate, I'm working on this project to plant a million trees because throughout their lifetime, they're going to remove 100,000 tons of CO2 from the atmosphere. Oh, and by the way, I'm doing chemical engineering. Now, chemical engineering is very important, but if you know that you are doing chemical engineering because you want to make the environment better, and you make the planet a better place for each and every one of us, I think that will put you in a very special place because you know your purpose and you know how to mobilize your academic excellence, your values and character, and that sense of well-being so that you achieve your aspiration, you achieve, you achieve success. So it's a journey from knowing your purpose discovering your purpose and towards mobilizing it into aspirations, success, and through positive impact. Through this, we have enduring happiness, and through this, we have endless, actually, the real, the most real kind of, 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 of success that, that marries financial and professional success with that self of, with that sense of satisfaction. So this model we call positive education, and we pride ourselves at pioneering it, not only in Malaysia, but actually in the world. And it's an amazing thing that this time, we and you, parents and educators, the community, when we focus on not only academic excellence, but also character, well-being, and that sense of purpose, we could be that precious metal. We could be that goal that will put these dreams together. So I will <clears throat> speak very, very quickly of one of the programs that all of our students need to go through. We call it the Empower program. And the Empower program has four different stages. So the first stage is about knowing and leading self. The following stage is about leading teams. And the third stage is about leading communities. And finally, it's about leading enterprise. The program is very well structured and it has six domains, as you could see. 
So it's about global citizenship, leadership and impact, emotional intelligence, resilience and happiness, people's skills, <clears throat> entrepreneurship, innovation and creativity, critical thinking and employability and industrial relevance. Now, every one of our students will have to go through the first stage, which is the what level. And the cornerstone of it is developing an impact statement that that uh, that uh, documents the purpose that they have discovered in themselves and also the impact they, they want to dedicate their life for. Research has shown people who are aware of the purpose they want to have and the impact they want to have on the world will be more motivated, particularly when things are tough. And this is a very tough time. So students will, as they go through, they will not, through this program, they will not get marks. They will get what we call what points. Now, what is, is, is um, uh, the unit of measuring power, but it's also uh, uh, named after James Watt, one of the titans of the first industrial revolution, a, a person that we are proud that our university carries his name. So we take the we take our students through this structured experience and we help them signpost the experiences where they have developed all of these soft skills that are very difficult to measure and to develop. So we want them to reflect when did they have a challenging conversation and how did they deal with it? We want them to reflect when, where, when they felt down and how did they use to motivate themselves so that, and at the end of the day, every one of our students who goes through this program will, has a transcript next to their academic transcript that actually shows to future employers and also to themselves, how did they attain all of these uh, skills, which is extremely important and extremely uh, valuable. And I want to just tell you that sometimes when we interview uh, people for jobs and we ask them, have you dealt with conflict? People are dumbfounded. They, 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 they can't remember the experiences where they have dealt with conflict. While for our students, they, they deal, all of us actually, but our students deal with conflict all the time. When, whenever you work with people and then uh, you are having uh, difficulties at tribute work or uh, having people who are not produ producing the work that they are supposed to do, there will be conflict. And how you resolve that in, a, in an amicable manner is an extremely important skill. This is the, these are the skills that we will need more of in the in the future. They'll be the basis of the value that we add to our work and to and they'll be the basis of our success. Now, I wanted to if I'm lucky, I will be able to show you this video, but it's a very short video about. The impact statements that our students have uh, developed and they will be uh, reading their impact statement to um, uh, to all of you.
So this is an example of some of the impact statement that our students have uh, uh, developed. And, and, and believe me, they are finding it amazingly motivational, particularly when times are difficult. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm reaching the end of my talk, but I just wanted you to think of COVID, this global pandemic and global challenge as a leadership opportunity for our youth, because it's very important that we frame the experience positively, because that's where the beginning of putting the pieces together with gold starts. So instead of like next time you think of COVID, you think about it as that negative thing that happened to the world. Think of it as an acronym for communication, for opportunity, for vision, for impact and for development. So for com communication, let's encourage our youth. What story are you telling? Who you are and to whom you are telling this story and what language are you using? Should you use like, I'm unlucky because I was born now and I had to deal with the pandemic at this stage? Or should you say, well, we are the chosen generation. We are the generation who survived this. We are the generation who is transformed by this. And we will make sure that the recovery that we are going to lead is going to be different. Opportunity. Always search for opportunities to add value because every one of us will need to add value to remain relevant. And that value needs to be at times discovered and created. So look for opportunities because there will be opportunities everywhere. Vision. How do you see the future? How do you see the recovery after COVID happening? Will we just go back to our old ways or will we start doing things differently? This is not an inevitable thing. It is a decision that we will jointly make. And I think that the more youth decide to go, you know, the green pathway rather than the traditional one, the world is going to move in their uh, direction. I talked about the impact statement that you've seen our, our, our uh, students talking about. So let's ask our students not only what course you want to do or what program that you want to join, because if you ask them like that, most likely they will tell you, I'm not sure. I've seen that happening again and again. But let's ask them, what impact do you want to have on the world? How do you want to shape the world beyond yourself? Because all of us are world shapers in one way or another. And the D is for development. Always learn, always develop yourself and help others develop as well. Which book have you read in the last month? How many books did you read in 2020? How many new ideas that you've discovered? Have you written something and put on, on, on your LinkedIn profile so that other people could learn from your experience? So we need to change the narrative and the change of the narrative will start by we seeing this Yes, as a great and real and true challenge, but at the same time, life will go on. Our youth have the right to have their dreams to be realized. Look at this beautiful teapot. I hope that you agree with me that these golden lines have added to its beauty. And indeed, they made it much, much more valuable and unique. So our promise is we'll work with you. We'll work with you as our students. We'll work with you as the parents of our students. And we'll be flexible and we'll be supportive because the dream, the dream is essential. So whether you want to study here, whether you want to travel to Edinburgh or to Dubai, whether you are, you, you want to do uh, uh, things away uh, from campus, we will enable these dreams and we will be always next to you because we believe that this generation is the chosen generation. This is the generation that's going to make 
the world a better place. And we are honored to work with all of you on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mushtaq. So now we'll start our question and answer session for the Q&A session. If you have questions, you can put up your hand. You can use the function that there, or you can also type your questions in the chat and Professor Mushtaq will address them. I see, uh, uh, I think a comment or a question here, say you mentioned about Empower program. I, I don't know, do you want to know more about the program or um, uh, I didn't get the, uh, the question. So I'll say just to fill the, the space, I, I'll say a few. OK. So the, every one of our students, while they are pursuing their professional degrees, they will go through what we call the Empower program. As I said, the program has four stages, and their stages are structured starting from knowing and leading self, because we believe that you can't become leaders of others before we lead our, ourselves first and without understanding our own motivations. So we spend the entire first year of the study of each and every program working with the students on finding, for example, their purpose, documenting it in an impact statement so that they could speak about it very eloquently like the students that I've shown you in the, uh, in the videos. Now, for the students who would like to continue, so the first level is compulsory. Every student has to do it. The next level, which is leading teams, leading uh, communities, and eventually leading enterprise, leading businesses, are, uh, are uh, not compulsory, but many of our students are choosing to, uh, to, 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 uh, to uh, continue working on developing themselves. And the idea is to utilize that sense of purpose that they've developed in their first year to, to impact, to influence the, um, the direction of their travel, the direction of their, of, their, um, of, their, uh, of their development, the project that they are taking. And how does it help me to get a job? A very good question. As I said in, in, the, in the talk, Employers are saying, we want people who have the ability to lead, the ability to communicate, the ability to influence others, people who are more creative, and people who are more aware. Now, when you go, when our students go for a job interview, you know, many of them think that in the, fir the first job interview, the interviewer is going to ask them, um, oh, OK, can you talk to me about uh, how do you solve this very complex, um, you know, math challenge? And they are shocked that no one is actually really asking them about the stuff they spent three or four years of their lives talking about. They ask them about, have you led teams? Have you dealt with conflict? Uh, what kind of projects that you've led? Uh, have you communicated to uh, in, in, in big group? And often, our students, when they go for job interviews, they find themselves reaching out to their experiences actually outside the classroom and within the Empower program to answer these, these questions from the employers in a very uh, meaningful way. So again, we are not saying 
we are not saying that uh, the the technological skills or the technical skills are not important. You know, if you are not a, if you don't have an engineering degree in the first place, they won't call you for the interview. But we are saying that these are increasingly becoming, you know, a given. This is just like your your passport to the interview. In the interview, especially if this job has thousands of people who applied for it, you need to stand out. And the Empower program is something that enables our graduates to, to stand up. We've spoken to employers and key world employers actually gave us the thumbs up and they say, these are the skills that we, we want uh, to, uh, to have in our, in our uh, uh, the people that we employ. Okay, there is a question, is Empower program part of the subject taught or over and above? So the, in the first year, as I said, it is a subject. So everyone will have to do it. It's compulsory. They will get credit for it. In the, in the uh, second and third and maybe fourth year, it will be about initiative. So the, uh, we encourage our students to join clubs and societies, to volunteer. These are, yes, they are over and beyond their academic bit, but they are actually as important in building their character, uh, and developing their, their values. So we didn't make it compulsory, but many of our students, because they are passionate about the purpose that they, are, uh, they have discovered, choose actually to continue working on, on leading teams and, and, and at least leading uh, uh, communities uh, in the Empower program. Okay, this is a very interesting question. Uh, it says, my daughter is very keen to study psychology, but I worry about the job prospects. I prefer her to do law. Any advice, please? Okay. Honestly, she should do the thing that she's passionate about. And the job aspects of psychology are tremendous. As a matter of fact, I know that today in the afternoon, my colleague, Professor Deborah Hall, who is the head of psychology and the global leader in our community for positive education, she will be speaking. I would encourage you, she has a PhD in psychology, so I encourage you to listen to her. But psychology is one of the most popular courses that is increasingly um, being in demand by both employers and also the, uh, the, the, the students. And specifically because the future is human and we need to understand our humanness. We need to know how do we motivate people? How do you, how do we um, uh, understand the, uh, the, how do we build more emotionally intelligent uh, worlds, governments, uh, uh, schools and so on. So we will, I foresee that we will be needing more psychologists, not, uh, not less. But I encourage you to really speak to Professor Hall, and I think uh, uh, Deborah has uh, has put um, some chat there, and she is listening to us. So great that she's here as well. Thanks. Hi all. We are running out of time at the moment. We have another session. We'll be starting soon. The session will be conducted by our Dr. Jasmine Lo, the head of the foundation program at Adelwood University, Malaysia. She will be talking about how positive education is embedded within our foundation programs as well, as well as the options that you have before you move on to the degree programs. You can stay on if you choose to join the session and or you can also register at the link provided in the chat. So thank you very much, Professor Mushtaq, for your time as well as for the wisdom shared with the rest of the audience. So thank you all for joining the session today. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.